Hey, hey, y'all. Welcome to Live at 1111. I'm glad y'all are here. If y'all would stand and we'll start doing a little worship in here. for y'all to worship this morning with us. And I think most of y'all maybe know this guy right here. We are so excited. <laughs> We're so excited to have both Alan and Kendall Reagan on our staff. We're really excited to have Avery and Patrick back as well. Um, yes. I don't know if the nursery <laughs> workers will agree with you that they're glad Patrick is here. Yes. <laughs> well, um, Alan is going to be serving as our administrative pastor, and Kendall will be serving as our family ministries assistant and working with our tweens. So um, we're just so glad to have y'all. So. No, thank you. <laughs> well, we are really, really glad to be here. It uh, feels like home. It always has. So we're really glad to be here and excited what God is going to do at St. Paul United Methodist Church. So, uh, and happy Super Bowl Sunday. Who that? Even though they're not there, they're going to be there in my heart. 
Um, and thank you so much for all of you who brought canned goods today to help us sack hunger. Uh, if you forgot, there's still time right after service to run to Walmart really quick or Dollar General. And uh, there's a booth right outside the door there that uh, you can drop that off. And we're going to take those to the Seashore Mission to help those who are struggling with hunger and such. Um, and uh, that is also a good reminder that through all of February, we're going to be uh, gathering donations for our healthcare workers who are working so hard to fight this terrible pandemic that we have going on. Yeah. And also, we want to let y'all know that today is the last day to sign up for confirmation. So if you um, know a sixth grader or older that wants to be a part of this faith journey, um, please sign them up. Um, you can do that at confirmation.stpaulos.org, or you can talk to me or Kendall, and um, we would love to get y'all um, connected with that. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, youth and clubhouse are not going to meet this Sunday. Enjoy the Super Bowl. Have a good time with your family and your friends and all that, but don't spread COVID. You know that, that stuff. And then uh, also next week is uh, Mardi Gras week. So we're uh, also not going to have youth or clubhouse that week. But the following Sunday, the 21st, uh, we're coming back and we're going to come back strong, have a great clubhouse and a great youth uh, that night. Yes. And if you're interested in getting more connected with our church, whether that's with kids or youth learning about baptism or serving, um, please connect with us, pastors, after the service. Or you can also fill out an online connect card um, at the link on the screen. Yeah. Well, with all that said, why don't we turn our hearts back to Christ now and focus on him. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you for who you are. You've been so good to us. You've done so many good things for us. So many things that we can praise you for and lift your name up for. But right now, Lord, we just lift you up for who you are. You are God Almighty who chooses to care about us and to love us and to be intimately involved with our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for loving us, no matter who we are, where we come from, how much money we have, or education, or jobs, or any of that, Lord. You don't care about the things that humans care about. You care about our hearts. And so, Father, we turn our hearts to you today, and we worship you. It's in the name of your Son we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
put the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good And you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take it You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Turn it for good, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy.
your name Your name is a lie The shadows can't deny Your name cannot be overcome Your name is a lie Forever lifted high Your name cannot be overcome Sing Jesus Jesus, Jesus You made the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus You silence me Jesus, Jesus You made the darkness tremble Jesus, Jesus Love is everywhere. Love is something we talk about, post about, and sing about. For many of us, when the word love leaves our lips, it sounds soft and fluffy, like sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns. Who wouldn't want to love others when it sounds so good? Unfortunately, love is abs absent from our words, our attitudes, our actions. We say we love others, but we really don't. Instead, we're quick to shake our fist at other drivers. We judge the stranger who looks strange, and we trash the person online who thinks differently than we do. Yet Jesus said that loving God and loving others is the most important thing. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to church this morning. It is Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm excited about that. We are currently in our sermon series called Love Has a Name, based on Adam Weber's book. Uh, with the same title. We have two more copies in the lobby if you want one of those. It's a great book filled with stories so easy to read. So feel free to grab one of those. In this series, we are learning all about the importance of love. And when Jesus was on this earth, he told us what the greatest commandment was, and it was to love God and to love others. This is our most important calling. However, this can be difficult for us at times. In week one, we talked about how we could overcome this challenge by learning someone's name and story. It seems like such a small gesture, but learning someone's name and taking the time to hear their story can communicate to them that they have value and worth. But it does something else too. When we hear a story, it can teach us about love, what it looks like in everyday life. And today I want to start off by telling you about my friend named Kunal. And you may be thinking, what kind of name is Kunal? But Kunal is from India. And I first met him when I was at seminary at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. And we were both students and we served on the chapel team there. And this team were the people who were chosen to help plan and lead worship on campus. And don't think I was that special because in reality, me and Kanal were up in the booth like them back there. He ran sound and I ran the slides. And if there's one thing that you need to know about seminary is that there are a lot of serious people there, especially on this team that, that leads and plans worship. But me and Kanal, we were kind of the outsiders. We were kind of the jokesters on this team. For example, Kunal was blown away when I told him about swamp people. He thought Cajuns were the coolest people that ever lived, and he had never even met one before. And he did his best as an Indian to um, learn their accents. And so anytime I saw Kunal on campus, he would holler out to me something about the swamp and gators, and it was really funny because he tried so hard, but he could never get it down. And needless to say, he was pretty excited when I was coming down here to serve a church that's on the bayou. So Kanal, if you're watching this, you're invited. I got plenty of people in this room that would love to take you out on the bayou to see some gators and tell you a little bit about Cajun culture. Um, but our relationship, mine and Kanal's relationship, went far beyond our jokes. We actually became pretty close friends. And as we grew closer together, he started telling me about his girlfriend, Oporva. 
While he was a student in America, Apoorva was back in India all the way across the world. Now let me tell you, I used to think that me and Hannah had a long distance relationship when I was in college because I was in Startville and she was in Birmingham. I called that long distance. However, this put a totally different perspective on what long distance was. And so being so far apart from one another, of course, they miss one another dearly, and they could only connect ever so often on FaceTime. But the story gets much more complicated than simply a long-distance relationship. See, Kanal was a Christian, but Apoorva's family were Hindus. And they, wanted to, they came to the point where they wanted to marry each other, but Apoorva's family would not give their blessing for them to get married. They didn't want somebody from a different religion to be marrying their daughter. And you may be thinking, well, so what? This is the 21st century. If they are denying giving the blessing for selfish reason, that's their problem, not yours. But things are different in India. The culture of India is very different from the U.S. It is what is called an honor and shame culture. It's more of like a community and everything matters to what you do and everybody looks at you in the community for what you do. And so if you do something against the norm of the culture, then you're looked down upon as being doing something shameful and you're treated differently for it. And so it's very important in the Indian culture for you to honor the family by getting the blessing. But even beyond that, a poor of his family, because they were Hindu, were were very connected to the political authorities of the area that they lived in. And her father even threatened Kanal's life that if he did something that he didn't approve of, then he would, he would send somebody to take him out. And they could do this, and no one would even blink an eye. And so Kanal, in his relationship with the Purva, faced a huge challenge. How long would he be willing to wait for this family's blessing? Was he willing to risk his life just to marry her? Would he ever even get this blessing so that they could get married? But Kanal wasn't going anywhere. He loved Apoorva so much that he would stay through every trial, hardship, and even harm just in hopes that he would have his wife one day. He resolved to stay and wait. And this is the type of love that Jesus loved with. And today I want us to look at one of the most powerful stories that we find where he shows his disciples love, when he washes their feet. And so we'll be in John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And I love how John sets the scene for this story, because it has to do a lot with what we've been talking about. It says this, It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, this is the key phrase right here. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So let's stop right there. I love that. Having loved his own who were in the world, having loved those friends, he loved them to the very end. No matter what came his way, he still loved these disciples. And John isn't just saying this because he just thinks it's a good idea. No, but he experienced Jesus' love up close and personal. And from his heart and his experience, he could confidently say that Jesus loved his friends and he loved them all the way to the end. And so what Jesus does is he demonstrates a love that stays when others leave. Jesus would go on to prove this by going to the cross to lay down his life for these very friends. And not just for those friends, but for the entire world, the sins of me and you included. And this foot-washing story happens right before he takes that journey to the cross. And at that moment, that moment is when he brought his closest friends together for that one last intimate moment. And what's crazy about this story is that he even includes the difficult ones. Jesus knew that one of these 12 disciples would go on to deny him three times in the coming days. He knew that another one of these disciples would go on to betray him and turn him over to be killed. But despite that, Jesus still chose to love them to the very end, including those two. When others left him, 
Jesus stayed because that's what love does. It's easy for us to love when life is easy, but it's much more difficult when we don't know what to do or say or how to help someone. My wish is that nothing difficult would ever happen to any one of us. But guess what? That's not a reality as a consequence of our sins. Sometimes a pandemic hits and everyone's life is thrown for a loop. Sometimes one of our friends abandons us and we feel alone. Sometimes people spread lies about us that aren't true or at least aren't the full story. But it's when life gets the messiest. It's those times that the people of God are called to stay. My first instinct is always to avoid and run from any problem that comes my way. But most times what I'm called to do is to stay, even when it is hard. It would have been easier for Kanal to walk away from his relationship with Apoorva. You know, they might have, he might have struggled emotionally from a breakup, but he would have got over it. He could have said, there's plenty of fish in the sea, I'm just going to move on. But Kanal chose to stay and wait. He chose to be patient, to humble himself, and to honor her family. To stay through the uncomfortable and frustrating times because he loved Apoorva. And this is what Jesus did for his friends too. He stayed and loved them until the very end. So now let's get back to the story in John chapter 13. Jesus gathers his disciples one last time before he is to leave this world. And he has supper with them. And then during the supper, he gets up, ties a towel around his waist, and fills up a bowl full of water. And then he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now let's be honest with ourselves for a minute. Most of us would agree that feet are kind of a nasty thing. What? There you go, Alan. Washing someone's feet is not something that we would want to do. And let me tell you, if it wasn't COVID, plenty of churches have foot washing ceremonies where you would turn and you would wash each other's feet. But you lucked out today because we're in a pandemic and we don't have to do that. <laughs> but imagine how much you don't want to wash someone's foot, feet today. Well, the disciples' feet would have been much worse than this. Their feet would have been nasty. They literally walked around in a desert with no closed-toed shoes, dirty, nasty, sweaty for days before they would shower. And so needless to say, their feet would have stunk and would have been gross. But still, Jesus chose to love his disciples in this way. He showed us that love is willing to get uncomfortable. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes life gets uncomfortable. Sometimes to be the best friend or family member that we can be, we have to stay with others even in their mess. One of the most profound parts of this story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet is that he even washed Peter who denied him and Judas who betrayed him their feet. As I alluded to earlier, Judas was the disciple that betrayed Jesus. Under the influence of Satan, Judas would go straight from this foot washing ceremony to the Jewish authorities to turn Jesus over to be killed. Jesus knew what was in Judas' heart. He knew the betrayal was coming. Jesus knew the anguish that was coming. The beatings, the scourging, the agonizing walk to Golgotha, and the ultimate torture, the cross. Yet even in that moment, Jesus chose to wash Judas' feet. Now that's a love far beyond what I can imagine. Think how uncomfortable this would have been, this situation. Especially for Judas, who knew exactly where he was going after this. He had his plan in his head, yet Jesus was there washing his feet. Think how uncomfortable that would be for me and you if we were in Jesus' shoes if we knew somebody was going to turn us over to be killed, yet we sat there and washed their feet. That would be incredibly difficult. But Jesus still chose to love his enemy, even though it was uncomfortable. And when I talked to Kanal, he, he shared a little bit about, what, uh, about how Apoorva became a Christian. And I found it interesting because it kind of came out of a place of discomfort. One day early on in their relationship, Kunal 
was away from a poor village. She asked him when he got back, where'd you go? And he said, I was away praying. I was talking with God. And this blew her mind, and it kind of made her uncomfortable. But it also intrigued her. Because when times got hard for Purva, she would go and try to pray to her stone Hindu idols, but she was not able to feel like there was anything happening in that moment. And so when Kanal spoke about talking with God and him being intimately involved in the situation, this was different from what she was used to. How could the mighty God be personally involved in her life? It just didn't make any sense. But it had an impact on her. She wanted to know about this God that would care so much about his people. And ultimately, praise God, she became a Christian and still has a relationship with him today. And uh, she's actually pursuing her counseling degree at Asbury Seminary and plans to go into ministry through counseling. So that's exciting. But that can be a challenge for many of us too. How could the God of the universe care about little old me? Well, we aren't the only ones who struggle to grasp this. In our passage today, we see Peter struggle to understand why God would choose to serve him. When Jesus bends down to wash his feet, Peter immediately objects to it. It's too uncomfortable for his master to wash his feet. And in verse 8, Peter says this, No, said Peter, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Immediately, Peter's tone changes. He says, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I want all of you. But it's understandable why Peter struggled with this. I mean, what kind of master washes his servant's feet? That's for the lowest of servants. What kind of teacher chooses to honor their student? Shouldn't this be the other way around? The servant serves the master and the student honors the teacher. But Jesus demonstrates something different. Jesus shows us that love is selfless. See, love is not something that we do to serve ourselves and to get somewhere. Rather, love is just simply serving the person in front of us because that is what we're called to do, no matter what their status is. This is why the kingdom of God is oftentimes called the upside-down kingdom. The way of the kingdom of God is very different than the ways of this world. The world says you got to do whatever you got to do to get to the top. Neglect your brother and sister, and then you'll make it. But Jesus says, no, wash their feet. The world says, crush the weak and fight to have power. But Jesus says, no, wash their feet. The world says you got to get everything right, and then you can come fit in with us. Jesus says, no, wash their feet. He washed Judas' feet. I heard Joel Houston from Hillsong United say this, and I love it. Listen to it. You don't have to believe to belong. I'm going to say that again. You don't have to believe to belong. And so maybe you're in this room, and you don't know if you believe. Maybe you don't know what this is all about. You don't even know why you're here. But let me tell you, you don't have to believe to belong in this place. Maybe you're struggling to understand how God could be so personal with you. But let me tell you, you don't have to believe to belong in this place. It's okay if you don't have it figured out because God wants you here. And he says you belong. He included Peter and Judas. He didn't say, oh, you're going to go betray me. You're going to go deny me. You can't be here. I'm not going to wash your feet. No, he said, even though you're going to go betray me, even though you will deny me, I still come to serve you. I still come to wash your feet. One of the craziest things that Jesus said, he said a lot of crazy things, but it comes in Matthew chapter 20. And when he's teaching his disciples about this upside down kingdom, it's verses 25 through 28 says this. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their high officials exercise authority over them. That's the ways of the world. Jesus says, not so with you. This is the way of my kingdom. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but listen to this, but he came to serve. And ultimately, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus never promised a comfortable life. He ultimately went to the cross, but he said, I came to serve. And that's what he tells us too. He says, you want to be great? Cool. First, you must serve. You want to be first? That's great. But you got to be a slave before You want life to be comfortable and easy, but didn't I come to serve you? Didn't I come to die for you? That's not comfortable, but it's the way of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus didn't come to just make the ways of this world better, but Jesus came to flip it upside down. And Jesus, in this story of him washing his disciples' feet, it sets the precedent for us. As the God of the universe, the fact that he still chose to serve and to die tells us that no one is beyond that calling. We are all called to love selflessly and to put others before ourselves. Canal loved like this when he chose to wait for Purva. And they spent many of the next few years waiting, patiently praying for her family to soften their hearts and to bless their marriage. They felt called by God to serve him, serve each other, and serve their families by waiting patiently for God to work a miracle. And it frequently got uncomfortable and messy. It wasn't easy. Love isn't always easy. But they remained steadfast and faithful in their loves. And then after years of waiting this past year, a Porvis family finally gave their blessing. And this past November... I have a picture of it. Kanal and Apoorva were married. Sorry. <laughs> I'm clapping. Uh, it's one of my really good friends. And so um, it's a beautiful representation of Indian culture that happened at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky. So um, praise God that he works miracles still. Praise God that he is faithful in love. And I pray that um, we will be able to be the same. And so today we're going to come to the table. Pastor Rick is going to lead us to the table Uh, this morning. And I want to remind you of what um, I said earlier. You don't have to believe to belong. Jesus invites you. Jesus invites you to his table. He invites you to come be served by him. It's him that's the head of this table. And we praise God that he would invite us. So let's pray and prepare our hearts for that. Dear Lord, I just want to uh, thank you for today. I want to thank you for the ways that you have loved us. Lord, I don't even understand the fact that you would serve me. That as the great God of high heaven, that you would come down to this earth to wash my feet. That is beyond what I can understand. But Lord, I just say yes. Yes to receiving it. Yes to your love. And I say yes to your commission to go out and love others. Lord, as we come to the table today, help us to be reminded of what love looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. It is our great privilege and joy to receive the Lord's blessing as we come to his table, the blessing of forgiveness of new life. And so let us be bold enough as God's children to pray our prayer of confession before receiving this blessing and sacrament. Let us pray together. Uh, We hear these words, Christ our Lord (laughs) invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we offer up these a humble gifts of bread and wine for the Lord to bless, to bless right back to us. We also offer ourselves and our gifts with the worship of our offering. 
And uh, of course, you're well acquainted with the fact that now we, we receive uh, our offering in a multitude of ways. You may give online, and many of you do. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Give.stpaulos.org is a way to do that, or go to our website and find the Give button and follow the links, or through the mail, St. Paul UMC, Box 909. Thanks be. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks in this moment uh, in which you're giving yourself to us that we may offer ourselves all that we are, all that we have, to your loving care. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join there in ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. If you've not found it already, your communion service is underneath your chair. Uh, you may have it in your hand already, and as you know, this is a two-layer uh, communion service that's self-contained. This is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Receive it now in his name. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go in the strength of your Holy Spirit to give ourselves to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't deserve it Still you give yourself 
Enjoy the Super Bowl this evening and go out knowing that you are loved. God loves you and he wants you to love him and love others. So know that today. Have a great day.